Good morning, everybody. Okay, we are uh, we're at the end of this unit, I think, and it is uh, it is session six. It's page thirty-two or page seventy-two. Sorry, in the uh, in the book, if you have a book there. Um, and the title of this lesson is um, Honor All Relationships. And uh, we're looking at basically the, the last of the three commandments that we've looked at all, all the, uh, the others, and this is just the last three. And this lesson um, puts them all, puts these three sort of all together and just calls it Honor All Relationships. And um, the subtitle is Integrity and Contentment in Christ Form the Foundation for Good Relationships. So, good relationships with each other, with people out in the world, within the church, um, it depends on, well, uh, a spirit of uh, friendship, love, commitment, and and the commandments are all about that, really. When we when we honor God and 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 love Him, uh, part of that is loving each other, loving others. And uh, these commandments, uh, these three, and all the others deal with that. So um, we're going to look at that today. So all the commandments, you know, uh, they're all rooted in love, and God wants us to love Him, to love each other, and it's the same. Uh, let's look first at Mark chapter 12, it's verse 28, just to start with. Um, this is Jesus talking about the commandments. It says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he hath answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he and to love him with all the heart and with all the strength and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that durst ask him any question. And then uh, if you look at Exodus 19, 3 through 5, this goes along with that. It says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you out, brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, Above all people, for all the earth is mine. The commandments, the commandments here, Jesus is telling us, and God is telling us here. God the Father is telling us. It, th these commandments, they were given by God out of a, a sense of his favor, out of his love. And they were for the people of Israel, and since the gospel has come to the Gentiles, for us as well, so that we can be a treasure. Peculiar treasure means different. And he had brought these Israelites out of bondage. All that God had done to bring these people, he says, on eagle's wings. It shows how much, that he, how much care he took to bring them to him. And how much he valued them. And not so that he could give them restrictive rules, but so that he could teach them how to be an exalted people, how to treat one another, uh, to love one another as he loved them, to have done so much for them. And his desire for them and for us is that they be a treasure. And so when we obey God and engage in that love, 
we become a treasure to God. And we become more like what his will is for us. So let's pray and and we'll get into the verses here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together once again to worship you, to study your word, to better understand what you would have us know. Father, we pray that your spirit be with us today. Help us to help us to understand, to learn. Be with us to get today, Father, to give us greater fellowship and for the services as we continue on. We pray, Father, for your favor and for your Holy Spirit to be among us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. So let's look at the first part. Exodus 20, 15 through 16 in the Bible says, Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Well, okay. Let's look at verse 15. Thou shalt not steal. Well, that's pretty simple, right? But you know I won't leave that alone. So it's wrong to steal physical things from people, right? If you're a thief and you go around pickpocketing or breaking into houses, yeah, that's wrong. But it's an offense also to participate in fraud. That's stealing too, right? To cook in the books. You know, we hear that talked about. This is bank fraud, you know, wire fraud, all these kind of, uh, you know, changing ledgers and things that go on in finance. That's also stealing. Um, uh, Misleading somebody about the value of something that's for sale, that's stealing as well. That's thievery. And Martin Luther, um, the Protestant reformer, he said that if you engage in something like that, he calls you a swivel chair robber. He says you're robbing just the same if you're sitting in a swiveling chair in an office. And this, this, um, this commandment, just like all the others, it comes from God's enduring love, just the same, because stealing from other people, it damages other people. But it also damages us. It damages our, our character. And Proverbs 22, 1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. So if you get caught, you will lose respect from other people. If you get away with it, you lose your self-respect. Either way, you have lost respect. And Paul wrote that the kingdom of God is set specifically against thieves, among others. In 1 Corinthians 6.10, he says, 6, 9, and 10, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves and mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And he tells the would-be thief how to, how to, how to redirect yourself, your actions, in Ephesians 4, 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. So it's, don't steal. Go exactly the opposite way. Labor and give. Change it up. But even beyond that, you know, stealing, it doesn't have to be from an action that you take. Stealing can be a lack of action, too. And Jesus talked about this Um, when he told the story of the rich man and Lazarus, it's in Luke 16, 19 through 23. This is one that we all sort of know about. Uh, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. So just just to take an experiment, so let's look at it from the rich man's perspective here. You know, being the kind of man that he probably was, he would probably have said to himself to try to justify it, look, 
I didn't do anything to Lazarus. I didn't have him whipped for blocking the gate up when people were coming through. I didn't have him dragged off or killed for making my guests uncomfortable when they were coming through the gate. I didn't have him dragged away from the gate. I let him sit there by my gate. He probably thought in himself that he treated the guy pretty well. So, do you think he would have been saying in hell, hey, I didn't even do anything to him. I left him alone. But what we, knowing what we know about God and the loving kindness of God, how will we answer him if he said that? Well, first of all, we've heard this attitude before, haven't we? It's in Genesis 4, 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. I don't have anything to do with him. I don't care. But we justify a lot with this kind of attitude. I, just, I don't have anything to do with it. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. It's not any of my business. But if we look at Matthew 25, verse 37 through 40, Jesus says, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw, we the, the, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And later on, he goes on to say the negative of that. You did not do it to the least of my brethren. You did not do it to me. So what did the rich man do to Lazarus? You stole from him. You owed him the exact thing that you did not give to him. You owed him mercy. You owed him charity. When you didn't give it to him, you stole it. What we owe to every person on earth is the same thing that we owe to Jesus Christ because he said it there. What you are to give to me, love, honor, charity, loyalty, kindness, you are to give to the very least person. And if you don't, you don't give it to Jesus. Whatever you consider the least, and that will be your enemy, some social class, it might be different to every person. Whatever you think a person's least, most least desirable circumstance is, you know, would, is it worse to be bitten by a thousand spiders or a thousand scorpions? Whatever, you know, it'll be different from what you consider the least is. But the least, we owe it to that person. And when we don't give it to them, we steal it from them. And that's where the rich man failed. He owed all that to Lazarus. And he broke this commandment. Stole it. And Luke 6, 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For the, out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. And that leads us into the next one. It says in verse 16, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. So, false witness. God is truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So there is a truth, and God is that truth. Now, we often say, you know, uh, the truth is subjective. You know, it depends on your point of view what the truth is. That's not true. Opinions are subjective. But the truth is a singular thing. And we should always let our speech reflect the nature of our Father in heaven, who is the truth. And the, the scriptures that he gave us are the truth. He gave us a way of knowing the truth. Not only the scriptures, but the Holy Spirit to discern the truth. And that's why this commandment is, tells us specifically deception, lying, false witness. All that is an offense to God because there is a truth and we have a way of knowing what the truth is. So there is no excuse for deception, for lying. 
If you look in, and he, and there are penalties for that. If you look at 1 Kings 21, it, there's a story of Ahab and Jezebel. This is a story of false witness. Ahab wanted to buy land for a man named Naboth, and Naboth, he wouldn't sell it to him. Ahab, he went home and he sulked. He was very childish about it. He laid in his bed, and he had his you know, face next to the wall. He wouldn't eat his dinner. His wife said, you won't eat your bread. What's wrong? Jezebel came in to him and said that. He said, oh, I can't get the land that I wanted. Here he is, the king, has probably everything he wants. But he, he covets this one piece of land just because he can't get it. So Jezebel hires these men to go. She, she hires them to go and say, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king, false witness. And they have Naboth stoned because of what these men said. So then God sends Elijah to the conspirators with this message in 1 Kings 21, 19. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. So if you look at this story, God holds them responsible, not just for the lie, not just for the deceit, also for the consequences of the lie. So we can't expect any better for ourselves. We're responsible when we lie, when we bear false witness, not only for what we say, not only for what we deceive, for everything that's caused by that lie. And it can be a big, long chain got to be careful about that and uh, especially the book of James is uh, has a lot about uh, lying how, how the tongue and, and lies and, and things that you say are dangerous he compares the tongue to a horse's bridle and a ship's the steering helm on a ship how how something so small can change the direction of something so large or you know a, a small bridle can change a big horse uh, direction uh, a uh, steering wheel on a ship, it can change the whole ship. And a little tongue in a person, it can change all kinds of things. It can change the whole world, matter of, uh, you know, dictators and things like that. Or it can change a person's whole uh, outlook on themselves if you break them down enough with just things that you say. It can change direction. So that's part of what this commandment is talking about. So let's look at the last one. This is uh, Exodus 20 and 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Why so specific? I don't know. I, I think maybe this is maybe to say there is nothing too small that it will not try to tempt you. So don't think, well, it's just this one little thing I'm going to obsess about. It's not going to grow and grow and grow. There's nothing too small that you can covet it and it be okay. And a lot of people have trouble with this one because, you know, it seems like on the surface you want to say, eh, you know, I just, why is thinking about it so bad? I don't actually do it. don't actually want to do it. But Jesus warned about this. We had this in, in the last lesson. Matthew 5, 28, Whosoever looketh on a woman with lust after her, to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So Jesus knew all these thoughts. They begin in the heart, in the mind, and it's difficult to stop that ball rolling once they start there. And then they become actions after that. And there's, you know, the, the psych psychologists and psychiatrists have the thing called the inner monologue. Where, you know, everybody, you have that where you talk to yourself. And everybody does it. It's a, an endless conversation that goes on. You know, when you see a billboard out there, you either you say, oh, I like that, or I don't like what that says, or I think something about whatever that is. Or you see something on TV, you say, oh, I like what that show is, or I don't like it, or I'm going to turn it off, I'm going to do something. And you're constantly talking to yourself about something, that, things that go on, you know. And 
Paul referenced this. He said, you know, you need to speak the right words to the inner man. That means when you're talking to yourself, you need to say, say the right words to yourself. And, uh, and that includes having the right thoughts, because what you say to yourself in this inner monologue will direct where you go, what your actions are going to be, what, what you uh, justify to yourself. And that's the sinner will convince himself what he does is justified, and then get yourself started on uh, down that, that spiral. And the warning of the Spirit is also in on that conversation. If you're saved, we'll try to warn you against it. Now, it's not wrong to have wants or desires, of course. We're talking about covetousness as wanting something that is someone else's, or wanting something without taking the steps needed to earn it for yourself. So you can have a lot of money, you can have a lot of stuff, but if having that money or keeping it, having that stuff or keeping it gets in the way of your relationship with God, you better get rid of it. Right? Jesus said to, if, if it offends you, cut it off. Now, if you don't have money or you don't have stuff and getting it gets in the way of your relationship with God, you better slow down. Now, we're warned against desiring things that belong to others or desiring things that would cause us to become greedy if we want to try to get them. In Proverbs 30, 8 through 9, the writer there says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So this writer is Goldilocks. I want, I want it just right. I don't want too hot. I don't want too many riches. I'll be tempted to I'm, I'm tempted. I'll be tempted to put God second. He knows what his weaknesses are. I don't want it too cold. I don't want to be too poor. Then I'll be tempted to blame God, and, and, and I'll be tempted to steal. He knows what his sinful nature is. He wants it just right. He says, God, give me just enough to do. And that's the correct attitude. We should be willing to accept good gifts from God, but content with just enough. And, and if, if you have the right priorities, you can have just enough with very, very little. Matthew six nineteen through 21 says, May, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust do, doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust do corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And the violation of so many other of these, these commandments and directives of God, it, comes, it starts here with this one, with covetousness, with the wanting of things that God has not decided that you're supposed to have. We want to override God. Now, I, God said I shouldn't have this. Obviously, I shouldn't have this, but I think I should have this. So I'm going to break all these commandments, I'm going to go against God's will, and I'm going to have it. And coveting leads to so much stealing, lying, blasphemy, and killing. Ahab, he should have taken that no from Naboth. But he let covetousness, covetousness consume him. He was the king, but he wanted that one thing he couldn't have. David. Coveted a man's wife. That servant came to him. The servant was too submissive to say, Hey, look in the first place. Why are you peeping at women on the rooftop, Mr. King? But he, he did have the foresight to say, this is, a, this is the wife of a man who is out fighting for you. You need to stop right there at the very thought of it. Don't go any further. Your, your covetousness is the start of your ruin. He warned him. So let's look at the last part real quick, and we'll stop with that. This is Psalm 37, 1 through 6. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. 
For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. So that's what we're not to do. So what are we supposed to do? Well, first of all, don't envy people who use corrupt crooked, deceitful, lying, stealing methods to obtain wealth and power and prestige and all that. And you'll pretty much have to check out of the celebrity culture if you're going to do that. And the psalmist says they will have their green season, just like the grass does, just like the dandelions do out there on, in, your, in your lawn. But just like when the lawnmower comes and the dandelions have to go, those people will also have their day when they are cut down. But those who store their treasures in heaven and trust in the Lord, you will be fed. You will be fed from the fruit of the tree of life. And if our delight is in the Lord and our trust, he will give us our desires. Now, if our desire, if our trust is in the Lord, our desire will be a closeness with the Lord, fellowship, <coughs> eternity with him, covenant with him. He will give us that. And if we are ever in a dark place in life, and we seek after righteousness, we study and learn, try to have good judgment, then we'll get out of it because God will take that thirst for righteousness that we have, and it says in verse 6, he will make a light out of it in that darkness. Not only that, he will make it like a noonday sun, and we'll get out of whatever dark place that is. That's a promise. So let's keep that in mind as we as we go forward in in our lives. It's these commandments are for each other. Getting along with each other, loving each other is honoring God. Because you know God is is a, a loving God and uh, the commandments that we have are, are meant to encourage us to to love not just to obey but to love and and that's as much a part of it as obedience it's the love so let's pray and we'll we'll end there we thank you again father for for bringing us together we thank you for this day and this church be with us father as we continue into the service we pray for a blessing on our song leaders on our pastor we pray that the message today will be a, a inspiring one we pray father that you will be with us we pray, Father, for all those who are here today. We pray a blessing on all those who could not make it today, whatever ailments are upon them. We pray for your healing wings to be on them. And, and we pray, Father, to bring more and more into our little church that we grow and grow and grow. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.